This is Ernie Barnes, and you're listening to Halftime. Okay, Mr. Barnes, um, thank you. First of all, I'd like to um, thank you for doing this interview. It's been a long time coming. Um, I wanted to talk about your books from Past to Palace. Your book seems to be a very personal expose of your transformation from a young man to a football player to an artist. What motivated you to write from Past to Palace? Well, uh, I felt that uh, for those who are coming behind me uh, and who have read some things about me, how I came about or how I was put together as an athlete and then as an artist is very important and information I feel that people could use, not necessarily uh, that they would choose the same path attack that I did, but uh, just to have that information uh, and to be able to use it as a, maybe an art yardstick for uh, their own success. So did you ever have any inspirations to be a writer? No. <laughs> uh, I n never really wanted to... Uh, Right, the um, I was severely challenged by that in school. Didn't do that well in it, but uh, uh, when I decided to put my story to paper, uh, I didn't have too much difficulty and found that words came fairly easily. For some reason, I can't put my finger as to why. Okay, Durham, the 1940s and the 1950s. What images influenced you the most? Uh, you mean by other artists? No, uh, no, just being in um, Durham, North Carolina. Oh, well, well, having grown up in Durham, I mean, everything I saw to some degree was a source of inspiration creatively because any idea is a good idea. It just depends on how you uh, develop it. Uh, Pettigrew Street was in existence when I was growing up, and that was the black business area where um, it was the, well, there was a the Regal Theater, the uh, hot dog stand, the barber shop, Elvira's Blue Tavern. It was a very active area, and so much so that uh, I'm pretty sure that as a kid I made sketches of the energy of that street. Okay, so, um, there, you mentioned a lot of artists in your book, From Past to Palette. Um, who were some of your favorite artists, and who inspired you the most? Boy, that would be difficult to say who inspired me the most. There, I, I, growing up, of course, we, as a kid, most of us grew up with the, uh, the works of Norman Rockwell, because they were uh, on the cover, I think it was... Uh, Look, our Post magazine, one of Post, I think it was. And uh, Norman Rockwell uh, portrayed everyday life in such a unique way that it captured the uh, hearts and the imagination of most people. Uh, so uh, to utilize uh, maybe his knack for being able to capture daily life, it certainly inspired me to reflect on that more so than to try and go into more uh, areas of art like abstract where there was very little understanding or comprehension as to what it was about. I read in the book that sir that um, you were reluctantly drawn into playing football while in high school at Hillside High School here in Durham. Tell us about that experience. Never wanted to play. It's just that simple. I, I, I grew up uh, introverted, shy, overprotected, and I, I, I guess I appreciated it to the fact that I did not want to uh, uh, venture out into areas where maybe it was uh, violent uh, or considered to be violent. It was just tough. And I wasn't uh, at the time conditioned for that. But uh, I had uh, people like uh, Tommy, Tommy Tucker who has passed on now, who's a teacher at Hillside, uh, who gave me a different view of sports and athletics, one that, one that captured my mind in terms of uh, the stuff discipline <coughs> uh, that is required, uh, the perseverance, uh, what you have to do to shape yourself into being not only an athlete, a good human being. So certain things from him began to make sense to me and 
from that, I was able to fashion my skills through a lot of hard work, and I guess you can say it paid off. Uh, I didn't. I, I was more desiring to become an artist when I left Central than an athlete, but uh, the course that was offered to me and that it was a paycheck at the end of it was a sport. Yeah, so I signed, I was the 10th draft choice of the Baltimore Colts. I signed uh, with them in 1960. Okay, that's They were, the, you know, no longer the Baltimore Colts, the Indianapolis Colts now. Okay, so you expressed an interest in pursuing a career as an artist while you were at um, North Carolina Central, then North Carolina College. But I guess in those times, as it is now, it's frowned upon by African Americans to pursue a career in art where people don't see an immediate paycheck. How did that make you feel then? Well, I, 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 I don't think I was that concerned about the paycheck. My father was more concerned about it than I. Uh, I was concerned more about being good as an artist. And I felt that if I could do that, the rest would take care of itself. And I haven't been too far off from that. Of course, there's a side of being an artist called business. If that doesn't happen, then you can forget about the creative side. Uh, I don't know how well I'm doing in, an, in, in answering your question, but... Um, everything I, I, takes off just a lot of determination and you have to know what you want and go after it so sir who bought your very first painting ever uh very first painting i saw was the sam jones so <laughs> sam was a, a student at north carolina central and captain of the basketball team and a, one heck of an athlete one heck of a basketball player and after his first season with the colts uh, no, <laughs> with the Celtics, with the Boston Boston Celtics, he came uh, back to Central. I was a freshman art major and had created something that looked like uh, my painting, The Sugar Shack. But uh, that was the first painting I ever sold for 90 bucks, and it was the Sam Jones. I, I, the reason I asked you that question because I, I interviewed Mr. Jones not too long ago and he said that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder. It's, Go ahead, sir. Uh, it's unfortunate that he that painting was lost. Uh, his home burned down. And so the, the painting went up uh, in that fire. So I right, turning the tables back on the athletic side, how did it feel to be the 10th pick in the first round in 1960 by the Baltimore Colts? Oh, man, it was, I was elated. Uh, during that time, to be any pick by any pro team, because not that many blacks were getting drafted into pro, ball, uh, pro football. And I think the year that I was drafted, there was about six of us. But uh, the feeling didn't hit me until I saw my name in the paper. And then it was a reality. That part uh, of the bridge had been crossed, and that was an extremely exciting morning for me and my family. So in the book, From Past to Palette, you mentioned how the whole time while you were in Durham, from high school and in college, you know, in the Durham community itself, you were living in the black world. But when you got drafted by the Colts, you had to go to Baltimore, and you were introduced to a new world. Could you talk about that? Well, growing up in Durham and in a segregated environment at the time, that was the fact of life. And uh, my, my friends, my education, my uh, way of thinking had been all fashioned in uh, that community between North Carolina Central and where I lived, uh, which is an area of Durham uh, that was then called the Bottom. But when I was drafted, I was no longer in Durham and in a new environment uh, where uh, people of other races and uh, 
adapting and understanding ways of uh, a culture where there was more money flowing than I was used to was uh, an educational experience and one I dealt with very slowly because I wanted to understand my placement in all of this thing called my new life. So tell us about your early years, um, that early year with the Baltimore Colts as a rookie. Well, <clears throat> as a rookie, uh, when I tell you, uh, I think maybe socially, what we had to play uh, exhibition games as they do now, but we played in a more hostile environment because we weren't allowed to stay together as a team uh, in any place but uh, on college campuses. So what you see now and the attitudes of uh, jumping around and slapping hands and bumping chests and that uh, the attitude of the players today, that didn't exist. That was not our discipline. Uh, wouldn't have made the team if we've done anything like that. Uh, it was difficult to make the team because then there was a quota. There was always an even number of blacks who made a professional team because they didn't want you sleeping together with with uh, whites. So there are so many little things like that that uh, I could touch on, but overall. Uh, it was an opportunity, and you would take that opportunity and make it do the best that you could with it for your own personal advancement and placement in life. And uh, I realized that that was something I had to do early because this was not a game that I uh, physically would be able to play all of my life and carry accolades one after the other, uh, week after week, and to uh, um, life, so I um, said I would do my best while I'm here on the field, but when I'm off, I have to find something else and really do my best in that. So, uh, oh, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's okay, it's just basically that was my thinking. Oh, okay. So, in, in your first, um, who... Who are some of the, the role, your role models coming to a team? Because I know every rookie has someone they look up to on the team that kind of helps them out a little bit. Oh, man. I don't think you would know the names of the players who were role models uh, uh, because they were they no longer uh, in the... Uh, their names aren't before the public. But the guy who taught me how to pass block, Jim Parker, was probably the best one of the best NFL linemen has ever played. Uh, it was a different way of playing than we couldn't use our hands, so it was a lot more difficult. But he was the best pass blocker and certainly my role model as an athlete. Uh, away from the field, you had to take your, uh, pick your images here and there. But uh, there are a variety of athletes and for, uh, for different reasons who became role models in, there in terms of visualizing myself as good as they and then working towards it only made me a better athlete. So did moving to Baltimore, did that give you fresh ideas, fresh images to work on or um, imagery as an artist? I wasn't thinking about too much being an artist when I was playing ball. I was thinking about it, but your time is totally consumed during the season with uh, being a football player. But there were times, moments, when I would take time to think about uh, their private times, and maybe I would sketch uh, oh, a pass-blocking uh, assignment, or what my assignment, what I understood my physical assignment would be against another athlete. Uh, there were times when I was, I got caught once sketching in a meeting and got fined 50 bucks for sketching, but 
uh, off seasons I thought more about becoming an artist and um, than I did during the during the season. I mean, I would I would see things, of course, when I was on the field playing. That I say one day this is going to make a good subject matter for a painting. Uh, so there were a lot of those those moments. Uh, much more than I can remember right now. So was it frustrating being an artist inside but having to play football to earn your keep? No, not frustrating uh, because uh, art is not something that's separated from life. It is life every day. It's how we style our hair, how we walk, how we fashion our dress. Uh, all of that is a part of who we are as a people and it is art, so when I was playing the game, it only uh, gave me more things to see or uh, exposed to that I would had I not been there. And I think really, really had I not been an athlete, I wouldn't be the quality of artist that I am today, so everything worked out in a very natural way. So would you say that you use football as a metaphor of, of for your life? It was like, well, it, it was, in other words, football was an extension of the art, art class. On the field activity was was physically what I had been maybe dealing with in an anatomy problem. How the body felt like in movement and then being able to translate that feeling to paper it was a constant challenge and it remains so today. But the attitude of... Uh, the body, all how it get, you, you can get into so many different uh, contortions and survive it. Uh, and hindsight is a miracle. When you're doing it, it's just part of the process of what you're doing, and you, you don't think about it. So when I reflect back on that, I would I can maybe grasp certain scenes, our experiences, and. Uh, try and bring them to paper uh, and then eventually maybe to a painting I was going to ask you um, now this is just my personal opinion it seems more like the, the, the sketches in, from pad to palette the football sketches and the, the paintings it seems like very dark and you mentioned a lot of painters in the, in the early part of the book and you also mentioned Goya and that's what a lot of those sketches and and paintings reminded me of, um, like especially his depictions of hell. A lot of on the field battle stuff is dark. With the everyday paintings, your everyday paintings, they seem to be more colorful, more exuberant. Is how how did you balance that? I mean, it was, it was, I guess what I'm trying to ask. Um, it seems like two very different things. It's like the everything on the football field, the battlefield, more like you know this war, and then you have this other side of you that can paint these just beautiful expressions of life? Uh, well, you know, I recall uh, when I was playing with the Broncos, my last year, or two years was in football I spent with Denver, and going underneath the South Stand uh, was a horrifying experience other than what you had to deal with on the field because you had the fans uh, the rowdiest fans in the city would sit in the South Stands and they would throw things at you and they would shout and they were angry uh, even if you were winning. We were having, having a losing season. But I thought of Goya. I thought of uh, his, his work when I, uh, one specific painting that I can't think of now that uh, reflected just that uh, uh, type of all the, the frustrations they were exhibiting and uh, week after week it was prevalent in my mind and there were paintings I did to capture that uh, that are now in collections but then there's another side of life that uh, when you're not on the field and you have to be a human being and um, many of the things that I painted like maybe the Sugar Shack or some of the, the paintings that other works that have a more soft and sensitive meaning didn't uh, happen until five or six years after my retirement. I became uh, 
focus more on the society day to day life of the society and when activities of life when I during the time of black is beautiful it was a theme uh, for black people and I'm black and I'm proud and I was asking myself well how and in what ways is black beautiful that's what we need to know and that's what as an artist I have an opportunity to show so that's how those things came about which was not until early 70s so you speak about the late 60s and you just said the early 70s how did the civil rights movement I mean so the, let me rephrase this as an artist did you feel that um, you needed to express what was going on during the civil rights movement as far as you saying what is black how is black beautiful well the essence of that movement yes I felt that I needed to express and I had, it had to be recorded because the, the, the movement itself was quite uh, energetic had some hostilities associated with it but it's what everybody was striving for that was that had the value and that's what I gave imagery to um and paintings like The Graduate. Uh, a young boy graduating from school, feeling proud, and walking down the street with his degree in his hand. Well, when you reflect on that painting, you have so many things you can go back in his background. You know maybe he came from poverty or whatever, but that's not important. It's where he is now. So that's the story, and that was the message. Many of the messages of that movement needed to be uh, featured in art and that's what I chose to do now I know when you went to the San Diego Chargers organization they knew about your art and your book and you said you were asked by the publicity department to do some drawings for the game programs how did that work out oh it worked out okay <laughs> I did uh, uh, paintings of almost well nine to ten guys Lance Allworth Paul Lowe Ernie Ladd, uh, most of the guys who they were doing a profile on each week, even myself. Um, so that uh, brought uh, some focus to the fact that uh, I wanted to become an artist during that time. And tell us about your relationship with Jack Kemp. With Jack? Yeah. Jack? <laughs> well, when we were players, we were, as, as players, we didn't communicate that much because Jack had a political opinion most of us didn't gr agree with. And uh, we were, I mean, it had nothing, no effect on how he could throw the ball. What was that opinion? Well, he was more to the right than uh, most of us. Uh, and his views he was quite outspoken with Ron Mix who was more to the left uh, they were very interesting and uh, locker room conversations not about football but about politics among many of us so he wasn't disliked he was liked because Jack is a very likable guy uh, when he became a congressman he was extremely supportive and always supportive of me. He uh, hosted one or two of my shows in Washington, uh, D.C., uh, along with Ethel Kennedy. He uh, is a super personality, man of great character, uh, very likable, great sense of humor, uh, dedicated to his opinion, and he has many. Uh, I, I just like Jack very much. So I'm going to mention another person. I um, hope I pronounced his name right. Sonny Wer Werblin? Sonny Werblin. Werblin, um, the owner of the New York Jets. This, and he's, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, he's kind of really credited, I mean, like in your book, as to really getting your career off the ground. He did. There's no doubt about it. Uh, if it had not been for Mr. Werblin, uh, 
I would not have been able to develop my talent, nor would I have been placed in a major New York gallery at the age of 26. Uh, Mr. Werblin was, uh, in addition to being extremely wealthy and having gained that wealth through the entertainment industry, he was uh, quite knowledgeable about American art. And he knew that my, once he had uh, gained supportive information that my I was worthy of his attention. Um, he became my patron for a year, paying me my football salary for what have, would have been a sixth season. I was painting and getting a game check. It was no different. I just was no different from playing. Other than I, I just wasn't playing. I was painting, which was not. It sounds uh, great, like it was super. It was a great experience for him. It, was, it wasn't that easy because after so many years of being a football player, it was very difficult for me to accept myself as an artist. I had to go back and rebuild my identity to me uh, because I was not comfortable in front of a canvas. I was only comfortable running up and down a field. So when season football season started, something in me started. And uh, But I was uh, able to develop my uh, something, get something on canvas during that first year that he was giving me his support, and at the end of it, he placed me with Grand Central Art Gallery, which is near closed, but was one of New York's most prestigious art galleries, and represent, they represented me for a number of years, but his placement of me in that gallery certainly gave me a uh, an identity to collectors and got my career off the ground. So tell us about your first show. Well, my first show at Grand Central was in 19, uh, I can't recall, 66, I think, or 65. And it was uh, after getting the paintings there and they all hanging on the wall and there's opening night. It's a lot different than, than a kickoff. <laughs> it's a different kind of a kickoff, <laughs> and there were people who showed up that were costumed in ways that uh, I was not accustomed to seeing, and so it was a shock to me. Uh, I didn't know what, I said, what the heck am I getting into. I mean, I, I didn't know. Uh, I didn't have a clear picture of what was called the art world and when I found out that I didn't have to belong really to that world and that was uh, much more assuring to me as a human being as a person as, as a male so when did you start to feel comfortable as an artist uh, maybe about three or four years after I had retired from football and had um, gotten most of those uh, memories placed um, and put behind me. Um, I could feel more uh, comfortable in that role because of the accolades that were coming back to me. They were from people who had once said I was a good athlete, uh, were, now, were now telling me I was a great artist, and that kind of endorsement is, uh, it just encourages you to continue to put, try and put one foot ahead of the other. So, as the uh, purchases from collectors and uh, comments from people that made me more comfortable with that identity. So do you still have the painting, um, the bench? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I sure do. Well, I wanted to ask you about the TV exposure. And because everyone, you know, especially because I'm 30, a lot of people younger than me uh, remember you from Good Times, the paintings on Good Times, J.J. Evans and stuff. So how did that change your career? Oh, well, it elevated it for sure because more people, Mass America became acquainted with my art through that show. 
Uh, one thing to understand is that during the time that I was growing up and uh, during the early 60s, uh, late 60s and 70s, there were few, if any, images by African Americans for and about African Americans available uh, to us. Uh, those that I painted were maybe among some of the first that were in print form. My mentor was Charles White, and there were very few images of Charles White's work uh, available. And the more I talk to you and start thinking about him, I'm losing identity with your question, <laughs> which, which was... That's so funny. Um, I was just asking you about the TV exposure. We just had a... Um, I'm looking at an article about Charles White that was just in the paper Sunday. Yes. The... Um, the, ex the the museum here has an exhibition on him right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I was asking, how did that TV exposure affect your career? Well, the Good Times exposure uh, just made uh, more of people aware of me as an artist. Uh, it wasn't that wasn't a, an audition. I was the way I got that was I went to see Norman Lear. Uh, about becoming one of the sponsors for my uh, exhibition, which was going to be held at the High Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. And it just so happened that he was working on a project which was titled The Black Family. And he said, well, I tell you what we can do. We can make this 18-year-old kid in here called JJ. We don't know what to do with him. Maybe make him a box for in a supermarket uh, now learning that you have always had desires to become an artist uh, we can make him an aspiring artist you can do his paintings and that way I can contribute to the show so you got a deal and it was that simple uh, the rest of it the use of the paintings over the credits was all Norman and um, I mean his, his idea he uh, wanted to give, he liked my work very much and wanted to give it as much visibility as he could and that was just a good fortune my good fortune to be in the right place at the right time Yeah, that, that show made a lot of pictures famous, especially um, Sugar Shack, what was the inspiration for that? Well, Durham uh, the Sugar Shack was really about Durham and leaving Durham and going to other cities and finding that there were other Sugar Shacks I mean, in Durham, there were, when I was in college there, there was a place called the Goodwill Club that uh, we all went to. And uh, uh, when I got into pro ball, I discovered other Goodwill Clubs, but most of them had names called, like, the Sugar Shack. So, but when I was a, a young boy, I went to a dance at the Durham Armory downtown, and the passion of, uh, that was generated from, by the dancers and me being so young, seeing that, that, that impression stayed in my mind. And when I was at Central and we were called upon to do certain things in art, that was one of the first things I reflected on, but I didn't do that. I did other assignments. I did the one that Sam Jones bought and some other paintings, and it wasn't until years later that I reflected back on that experience and say, well, I'm going to do this painting. And the name, The Sugar Shack, just came from my travels around different cities in the, where there were NFL teams. And when we went out, we always found a sugar shack. <laughs> That's Durham, believe me, Durham still has some sugar shacks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, that, that reminds me of another painting, especially, I think, is everyone in Durham's mind is like I drive down Roxborough Road every day going to work and every time I see that 15501 sign in front of that train overpass I think about your painting The Homecoming tell us, about, <laughs> tell us about that well you should have been there for the real experience because it was something to see Hillside had a band that was considered to be better than outstanding especially their marching band Central had a good band but it didn't come up seemingly to what Hillside could do. They didn't know how to really get down. It's, it's still that way. And, uh, and like I said, it was segregated. 
during that time, so it was a big, big, big thing for the Hillside uh, members of that band to not only do their best, but to add a little step here, a little movement here. And when the, with the syncopated rhythm of those drums, man, I'm going to tell you, you had quite a show coming down Main Street. And when it came under that path, they were that's, that's when they were turning into the black area. And they had to really be impressive. So making that turn under that bridge um, was where I stood most of the time because I, I, I really want to see everybody hit that corner and make that turn. So when I did my book, it was just natural for me to reflect on that and use a painting that uh, is from that time period. It was it's a recall for me of that experience. Uh, this is a question um, I don't know how you feel about. I think the listeners might want to know. How do you feel about your imitators? <laughs> well, it bothers me uh, to some degree. At first, uh, I was quite complimented by but there never there are too many. Uh, so there's a gentleman in Washington, D.C. by the name of Josh Kaufman, an attorney who looks out for me in those areas now. And there's only one young man who I'm still allowing to uh, sell his copy of The Sugar Shack. Uh, and that's Ernest Watson, who's, uh, he is from North Carolina. That's the only reason I haven't gone after. And you can't believe how many calls my office gets almost weekly with that information and that print has been out for quite a bit of time but so many people are, new people are discovering it and he just copied the sugar shack so flattery uh, imitation is a form of flattery I suppose but uh, I would much prefer seeing those guys coming behind me to do their own ideas and do better than I'm doing and I'm trying because it's very important that uh, our ident identity as artists in America escape the boundaries of being black artists and just become artists. So, be saying that, how do you how do you view yourself as an artist? How do I view myself? Like you just said, as an African American artist or just a great artist? I never dealt too many too much with uh, handles of African American and black. That's usually the properties of other people. Uh, I'm Ernie Barnes. I know what that's about in terms of my character, and that's sufficient. Now, if I meet um, some opposing uh, idea <laughs> about me, then I, I deal with that then. But I, I've not had too many. Um, hands shoved in my chest to keep me back. Uh, I, I'm very much concerned about uh, those of us who call ourselves black artists. Uh, there's no such thing as black art. It's not a viable academic category. There is art, and if you choose to paint black themes, then that's what you choose to paint. If you're black and you choose to paint white themes, and that's what you choose to paint, the connection and the difference being that people would say, well, that's not part of who you are, that's not your identity. But if you have an opinion and you work from that opinion, it's no different than painting trees. That is uh, just a different subject matter. How it's treated depends on the nature of the person who's doing it. Uh, and I think it's extremely limiting for somebody to put themselves into that category and say I'm a black artist you know what does it mean you only do black themes uh, I mean I, I don't know I don't know it's, it's too restrictive for me to really identify with and I've never participated in a show that was an all black show and I never intend to 
Well, so I only have a few more questions left, but let me know if this is going too long and I'll cut it short. Um, I want to talk about some of your recent commissions, um, the Carolina Panthers and the NBA. Well, uh, the Carolina Panthers commission came about as a result of the fact that Jerry Richardson and I were teammates for a short while uh, in Baltimore. Jerry was, when I got there in 60, he was going into his second year. And I think he retired after that year and went back to Green, uh, South Carolina and opened his first Hardee's, which uh, has now blossomed into many Hardee's. And he has El Pollo Loco, and he has done enormously well. And uh, when he bought the Panthers, uh, became owner of the Panthers, when it was built in the stadium, he wanted a mural. A painting but he didn't have an identity or fix on me as who would do it because when I saw him last he was on his way back to South Carolina and I heard he had opened a, a hamburger stand now that was it I'm living out here in California and I'm not eating too many hamburgers or not I read that many pages of Wall Street Journal to find out what's going on business-wise, so when I learned that Jerry Richardson is the Jerry Richardson, it was a huge shock to me. And same thing to him when he found out who I was and what I was doing. So we had one big laugh and got down to business and he uh, commissioned that uh, painting that hangs in Carolina Stadium. Yeah, that's one of the things um, I want to touch on later. But what about the the, the one for the NBA. The NBA, NBA. That is the 50th anniversary thing. Yes, sir. Oh, that was, uh, yeah, well, commemorating 50 years of basketball in America. Uh, and that came about, really, as uh, you mentioned Sam Jones. Well, on that team, there was a guy by the name of Sat Sanders that was Sam's teammate. And Sam, uh, Sat Sanders is now working in the NBA office. So when there was a meeting for a discuss artist who would be uh, in line to do the painting, there was Leroy Neiman, uh, uh, um, Blair Bushwell, and some other artists, uh, a lot of other artists. But he held up his hand and he said, there's only one person to do this assignment, that's Ernie Barnes, and he told them why, and we, I, they saw my work and they commissioned me to do it, and that was it. Okay, um, have you ever done any children's books? No, no, never. And don't want to do any? Well, uh, I haven't really given it that much thought. Uh, I don't know how much my art would lend itself to certain, maybe in certain themes in an inspirational way might uh, lend itself to that and maybe that's something we should put on the table to uh, consider but it hasn't been I have been approached and it's not in my game plan okay um, what about animation that isn't either okay. uh, living out here in Hollywood I've been approached several times about, about various people for uh, doing something in animation there was one film company wanted to do Pats to Pilot in animation and I had to say no Okay, real quick, I want to backtrack. I want to. I want you to talk about your days playing football. Who was the coach and your days playing football at North Carolina College? Well, Herman Riddick was the head coach at North Carolina College. And he had an assistant coach. His line coach was Jimmy Stevens. And if I could see him today, I'd probably want to hit him with a crossbody block. Woo! <laughs> 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 Man was on my case daily, but... Had he not been, I would not have become the athlete I was able to become. So explain those days playing back in uh, the early days of the CIAA. Well, there were some guys that played before me, you know. <laughs> so their, their stories would really be trippy. But, uh, um, you know, it was no big deal. We had... We, I, I, I don't know what the uniform situation is there now. I guess it's better than it was when we were there. But we had these maroon uniforms with gray patches on the shoulders. And we were solid 
as a team. I mean, athletically, you will see what you're getting now is a, a lot of the kids, uh, young men who were going to Georgia Tech, University of North Carolina, Duke. During, back during that time, couldn't, those the ones I played with didn't have that opportunity. So you got a huge supply of very, very good athletes. And uh, those are the ones you had to go up against every year. Uh, and they kept you on your toes. So the teams were solid. I mean, basketball-wise as well as football. We, uh, A&T was our rival every year. I guess that's still the situation. But uh, we, we, that was a huge game every year. And, and you know, we didn't have, of course, all the facilities you have guys there now, Kelly Field, and it looks more like a stadium than it did. We would look at a sandlot field when I was there. Mm. But uh, I don't know the if spirit that. on that campus and the um, people, <laughs> the climate there was just so genuine and so rich and there was a, a, a lot of uh, what you call campus spirit. And it was a safe campus, a fun campus. Um, students were supportive of one another. It was a good time to be in school. And even though my desires were to go to other schools I couldn't go to, I am so very happy that uh, the decision I made was to stay at home in Durham and to attend North Carolina Central University, which was North Carolina College. I had played there on that campus as a kid, and uh, it was just right for me. Sounds like the um, same thing Mr. Sam Jones said. You two must have had a good time when you were in college. Well, that, we did. And uh, <clears throat> it's one of those things where you had to be there. <laughs> so I mean, I'm so sorry that you guys today. I know you're having a good time. Yeah, <laughs> what you? The ladies are still pretty, huh? <laughs> I'm saying the ladies are still pretty. Oh yeah, yeah, they, they're still very beautiful. I, I, when I come home, as a matter of fact, in a couple of weeks, I'll be walking around on campus. I'll be home. I'm coming home to see my mother. But so I know what's going on there, but. Not the same thing, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I can understand. <laughs> I can understand. I well, wish it were. It was just so uh, such a good time to be in school, and I don't know if you guys consider that today to be that. But well, Mr. Barnes, my one of my last questions is: um, Has anyone in Durham ever approached you about doing a mural for the city or anything? Oh, they've approached me. But that's been about it. So nothing, not, nothing huh? real serious. No, uh, just inquiries uh, as to a fee, and that's that's it. Uh, would I like to do something? Yeah, I would. I would, would, would. I would be tremendously challenged to do something, but uh, I don't uh, feel that. I don't I know. I don't know. Well, I'm going to play this and so I'll make sure all the city council people hear this. Oh, <laughs> I'll be kind. Make, okay. make, sure, make sure they listen in to this because the people in Durham would love to see an Ernie Barnes mural on one of these empty walls around here. <laughs> well, I'd love to do it. Okay, and Mr. Barnes, thank you for this interview. Thank you for your time. I'm glad I got to sit down and talk to you. Um, you say you're coming to Durham? Oh, yeah. Well, you should stop by the radio station. All right. A WNCU. I hope. Um, what day are you coming so I can try to be Oh, there. I don't know right now. Okay. I haven't made uh, those final plans, but okay. uh, um, we'll be shortly. Because I'd love to meet you in person, sir. Oh, um, I'll, I'll come by the radio station. Thank you, sir. Um, and I'll call Miss um, Rodriguez and thank her again. And I, I'd just like to say thank you once, once more for your time. Thank you very much. I'll be talking to you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.